welcome to Addicted to Murder. This is Courtney, licensed professional counselor with over a decade of experience. And this is Trisha. And Courtney, I'm curious if you've ever che- uh, treated anyone for signanthropy. 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 I do not believe so. <laughs> it's madness in which a person thinks he is a dog. Oh. Well... There is the new trend of being a Therian, which is maybe similar to that. Do you think they're mad? Do you think they really are animals? No, I don't think they are. I think that they identify with traits of certain animals, Mm -hmm. and they're trying. People who are Therians or claim to be Therians, which means they identify as something that is non-human. Non-human. I've seen it a lot in kind of like middle school aged girls, Mm -hmm. um, oftentimes who are on the autism spectrum, although not always. Um, But I think they're trying to find a way to to fit in and find a place where they fit. And so sometimes identifying as an animal feels more true to them than identifying as a person. Hmm. I mean, I've heard of it, you know, and I've been seeing more and more stuff like on Instagram reels and stuff. But I don't know much about the Therians. Therian or a Therian? Therian. Therian. Okay. Yes. Um, so thanks for that, Courtney. You're welcome. We're a little discombobulated because Courtney is now the editor. <laughs> <laughs> Which I haven't been for <laughs> since the very beginning, really. For some reason, my computer decided it no longer wants to acknowledge the interface. So there's only one more login left, and that is Courtney's computer. And so after about two years, Courtney is now wearing the headphones. We have switched microphones. We have switched places on the table. And um, yeah, you're looking a little nervous about it. I mean, I. it's a different angle in the room. Yeah. Oh, and the um, room is all is all done differently too. Yeah. And I'm not used to wearing the headphones. Mm-hmm. So hearing us while we're talking is a little bit different it's than weird. just hearing us talk in the room. Right. But one of us has to hear us talk because sometimes the shit goes awry. It's true. And it goes... Well, it hasn't done that yet. Except for you doing that right now. But maybe with your computer is newer, it won't do that. Hopefully. So, anyhow, if we're a little bit off our game today, not only is the pod room totally... uh, I got new floors in it and I moved everything around, but we're in completely different roles, so to speak, now as far as... uh, (laughs) <laughs> producing <laughs> you are now the producer you got this you got this so anyhow uh we're gonna do um another like how we did halloween episode we're gonna do a thanksgiving episode today and we may have one more come out next week i don't know this might be it for a while um it's a busy time of year it is and i'm gone next weekend chris's uh stepmom passed away a couple weeks ago so we got to go down south and do some stuff down there, and we'll be there. And the week weekend. after that is Thanksgiving. That's true, which is another big weekend. Yes. Are you doing anything? Like going yeah. anywhere? I don't know yet. No, I'm not sure of my plans. I have 16 people coming. That's a lot of people. It's a lot of people. It's a little nerve wracking. But yeah, I, I might go up to my aunt's up in Washington. Vancouver. Yeah. yeah, but not, not sure exactly which aunt's house it's going to be at this year. Nice. So we'll see. Well, hopefully it's good weather for you. Hopefully. I mean, or at least like not dangerous weather for you. (laughs) Well, before we get started, I have a question. Now, I don't know how long you've wanted to be a therapist, but if you were not a therapist, what would you want to do for a career? Hmm. Well, I've wanted to be a therapist for a very long time. Um, So pretty much my whole teenage plus life but I think if I were not a therapist I would probably either do something like like maybe want to be like a writer Mm -hmm. maybe or like a novelist or like a journalist like a novelist Uh kind of thing although I don't know that I would ever actually complete a novel we'll see yeah um or maybe like something like maybe like a, a pastry chef. Okay. All over yeah. the place. Baking yeah. is, is fun and is yeah. relaxing. Yeah. And creative. And creative. Yeah. Watching those like holiday baking shows are always fun. 
Oh my gosh, I'm obsessed. Yeah. I had to watch one the other day because I was at the dentist and they have TVs in there. Oh. So. I watch them by choice. Well, I mean, I didn't like have to, but <laughs> I don't usually watch baking shows too often except for Chopped, but that's more of a cooking show. Yeah. yeah it so. is. Well, I would totally be a travel agent. I can see that. I love planning vacays and like I'm a little um, OCD about it, having Mm -hmm. exact routes and, you know, how many miles or how long it takes to get to each place to stop everywhere. And, you know, when we went to Ireland, I created the itinerary and it was pretty extensive. Both times I went to Ireland and Maine, same thing. So I, I just love, I don't know, I love traveling, but I also just love the creating of the itinerary. So I think I would do that, even though I don't know how much of a, with with AI and with um, travel websites now, I don't know how that profession's going. I do know somebody somebody that um, I used to work with that just opened her own travel website, or I mean, mm-hmm. uh, whatever I called it. Yeah. I know of someone who's a travel agent. Yeah. I imagine with the more wealthy folk who still travel Mm -hmm. and do things that's more of like a job for them and well and like usually with travel agents it's not you don't you don't have to pay to use them they get like reimbursed or kickbacks from the hotels right so it's not like it's an expensive thing to use them um so I don't know I've used them a couple times not like Expedia but like an actual travel agent And I feel like it went pretty good because then if something goes awry, like they're there to fix it, you know, whereas Expedia is not. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. So, all right. Well, that's my question. That was a good question. How are you feeling? Better. Okay. I'm just watching your face and, (laughs) (laughs) and if this, if this gets all messed up, we'll just record it again. It's all good. You know? All right. Well, like I said, we're doing a Thanksgiving episode today. And it's not a serial killer again, but it is a woman killer. Yes. And uh, we just tried to watch a little bit about her. I wrote this up based on what I could find on the internet, but there was a snapped episode about her. And of course it was the one episode we couldn't freaking find right on, mm-hmm. you know, it was supposed to be in all these channels and it wasn't, um, but we did find a little bit on YouTube. So we are going to be doing the case of Omema Nelson. Um, actually, I'm not really sure what her maiden name was I probably wouldn't be able to pronounce it because she is not from here but had you heard about this case no I had never heard of this before me me neither so it was pretty gnarly too I'm a little bit kind of surprised I bet some of our true fan like hardcore fans well you're a pretty hardcore fan I'm a pretty yeah like hardcore like true crime um do you watch snapped on the reg is that one of your shows that you watch um, it's not one of the ones I watch on the rec, but I've watched a lot of Deadly Women, and we oh. did see that there was a Deadly Women episode okay. with her in it. Yeah. All right. Well, like I said, she wasn't born here, but she was born in 1968 in Cairo, Egypt. So, yeah, over there. She was one of 16 children. Do you know we have a friend that has 15 siblings? I know. It's crazy. Yeah. I can't even imagine. No. Or being that mom. No. Pregnant for... 20 years probably. all the time yeah so during that time and place in Egypt in you know I, I don't know when that fell out well maybe we talk about it but during that time in the 60s all the way up to what oh 2008 um, what was common there was for little girls to get female genital uh, mutilation done so her father wanted to have her have that done and it, it was unfortunately done so when I go to Wikipedia to look at this it says that 87% of girls and women had this done between 2004 and 2015. So that was just, like, they were just looking at that span of time. Right. And in that area, yeah. not worldwide. Right, right. <laughs> so 87%. So it's very, very common for that to happen. It's a cultural pr- uh, practice that predates Christianity and Islam. And it's done to maintain purity. You know, that's what the thought is behind it. It was banned in 2008, but it wasn't policed much. So people were still doing it. By 2016, however, it was made a felony, so, you know, that's good. And what it entails is the cutting and removal of some or all of the vulva for non-medical reasons. Basically, they're removing any sort of pleasure zone in a woman to Mm -hmm. 
you know, discourage sexual acts before marriage. And it can happen at any age. It's pretty gnarly. Uh, we just saw the tool they used on the YouTube video. And it was reminiscent of, like, a gardening tool. It's horrifying. Right. I'm sure they don't have any anesthetic. I'm sure it's just, like... And it's not a doctor or anyone right. medical training doing it. So, uh, but at some point, um, Omema and two of her sisters moved away and lived with their mother uh, to a pretty impoverished place outside of Cairo. Courtney. So 15 siblings, female mutilation at age around six, pretty much extreme poverty is what we're learning. What are your thoughts? So I imagine that Omaima's childhood was not an easy one. Uh, it'd be quite difficult to provide for that many children, both meeting their physical needs and their emotional needs. And this may be why she ended up living with just her mother and two sisters. Being separated from her father and other siblings could have been hard for her, depending on the circumstances. We just we don't know a whole lot about that time in her life, but she may have felt abandoned or unwanted. Um, and Wikipedia also stated that she lived in a necropolis, which is basically like a large above-ground cemetery. They called it like the city of the dead. Um, and so just kind of growing up in this environment, she's exposed to death from a pretty young age, um, just being around it, um, not necessarily you know taking part in it or anything, but just growing up around it. Um, and then as for her experience with genital mutilation, like you said, it's a horrific practice intended to prevent girls and women from experiencing sexual pleasure. That's the belief that it will prevent them from having premarital sex. Um, and it was often performed, like you said, without an anesthesia, not by a doctor. So the pain would have been excruciating and it would absolutely be considered a traumatic experience. Yeah, I don't even, I can't even imagine no. that, you know, I mean, I, I, I know we, you could say the same thing about circumcision, but typically at least that is done with numbing. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually assisted in one as an MA and it's on a, a very little baby who won't remember it. It's, right. It, whether or not it's barbaric, I, that, I don't have any kids. <laughs> I'm not saying, but it's, this seems abhorrent versus circumcision, but that's what I'm going to say. So in 1986, when she was about uh, 18 years old, she came to the United States after marrying an American citizen named Roger. They unfortunately divorced shortly after she arrived, and she ended up living in Southern California. She worked as a nanny, but she was also a very beautiful woman, woman and she was able to be a, like a part-time model. She, she allegedly had many boyfriends and was accused of having possibly be soliciting older men, you know, exchanging sex for money. She had a couple aliases, Issa or Nadia. She got a driver's license, but she wasn't a great driver, and she racked up 12 violations, one of which was actually car theft from a boyfriend, so not really a, a driving violation, but she was in and out of jail is what we kind of learned from the documentary stuff that we just watched. She had a bit of a criminal record. She was accused by a 61-year-old male who pointed a gun at him while he... Oh, sorry. She was accused by a 61-year-old that said that she pointed a gun at him while he was tied up in a consensual bondage and sexual act. Charges were not filed in that case. However, another boyfriend also accused her that she held a knife to his throat while they were dating. She said it was a consensual sexual act. She did get a charge of battery in 1989 because she assaulted a female security guard who caught her in the act of shoplifting, and she bit that security guard's breast. Mm -hmm. So, Courtney, we know not a lot about this person, I realize, but from what we do know, let's unpack it. Possible solicitation, violent sexual acts that may or may not be consensual on both sides. Uh, she disregards the law, and she's not afraid to fight authority figures, you know, and she's shoplifting and doing other crimes. Yeah, so we don't know much about her childhood, but it would not surprise me if she or her family um, had resorted to stealing or possibly even sex work back in Cairo to get their needs met. They were, like you said, an object poverty. Um, so, you know, she could have sort of learned 
how to do that and how to separate herself from that emotionally um, as a way of, to, of survival. Um, but then also, you know, Omaima was a beautiful woman. She worked as a model and probably knew how to use that to her advantage. And adding that to the sexual trauma that she experienced at age six, it could have created a connection between sex and violence in her mind that later emerged as like some kind of bondage fetish. Do you want to speculate on any a, like disorders or anything like that besides the fetish you just said? I mean, just looking at behaviors, mm -hmm. you know, there might be some um, indications of some antisocial traits, mm -hmm. um, but I just don't know enough to give any sort of, like, real diagnosis. Okay. Well, in October of 1991, she was around the age of 23, and she met William, or Bill, Nelson during a pool game at a bar in Huntington Beach. Bill was 56 years old, so about over twice her age. And he was a pilot out of Laredo, Texas, and a computer programmer. He was no saint himself. He had just gotten out of prison for four years because he attempted to smuggle in 100 tons of marijuana through his old pilot job. After playing that pool game, he must have been smitten with her because it was said they got engaged two days later. Bill's attorney saw them on their honeymoon later on and said they seemed like a happy couple. They may have had an Egyptian ceremony. However, no official marriage record could be found. Um, there was talk of it happening in Arizona or Las Vegas. There were suspicions that Omaima, oh sorry, Omaima married him for his money, but who knows? Bill was possibly still married to his first wife at the time, so it didn't appear that it was legit legitimate even if they had gotten married. Regardless of the logistics of the relationship, Bill's employer would report him missing the following month. Okay, so on Thanksgiving Day, which in 1991 was November 28th, Omaima claimed that Bill had sexually assaulted her in their apartment and tied her to the bed in a bondage act. She claims that she broke free of her restraints and hit Bill with a lamp and then proceeded to stab him with scissors and further beat, beat him with a clothes iron. Per one source, she beat him so severely with the clothes iron that it broke in her hand, the clothes iron did. It would later be determined that he died of several stab wounds. So, Courtney, can we talk a little bit about what is known as overkill? Overkill is a term often used to describe acts of violence where the assailant continues with the attack far beyond what have been necessary to disable or kill the victim. So this occurs most often when a person is experiencing high levels of emotion and or has a strong emotional connection to their victim and is acting impulsively in response to a trigger. So Omaima, in response to being sexually assaulted, um, if that's what occurred, likely reacted from a place of trauma and rage, lashing out wildly against Bill until the emotion passed, rather than stopping at the point where he was no longer an immediate threat. I mean, I imagine she has lots of rage just based on what we know so far and all the things she's been through and right, had absolutely. to do to survive. So it's not very surprising. So just a warning, this part of the story is a little gnarly. After Bill was deceased, Omaima continued to mutilate his corpse. She dismembered his bodies and cooked his hands in a pot of hot oil. She would later claim she boiled the hands in the oil to remove his fingerprints. She stuck his head in the freezer, thinking she would uh, need to remove his teeth probably again to get rid of identifying features. Um, it was Thanksgiving, remember, and so for our listeners who do not celebrate Thanksgiving, it is also known as Turkey Day because, well, usually there's a big turkey as the main dish of this somewhat controversial American holiday. So she then mixed up some of his body parts with some of the turkey that they had been eating for Thanksgiving and put it in the garbage disposal. Later on, the neighbors said the disposal was running for hours on end, um, maybe until it broke. That's what we just heard as well. It was then reported that she castrated Bill for his alleged sexual assaults on her. Poor Wikipedia, she later told her psychiatrist that she cooked Bill's ribs in barbecue sauce and ate them. Per one article, she said, quote, it's so sweet. She has since denied that she has, like, ate him, but... I don't know. Apparently she said that at one point. This dismemberment took 12 hours, and her psychiatrist claims that she was in a trance-like state the entire time. What about you, Courtney? What do you think? 
I think it's possible that she went into a dissociative state during or after the attack. Um, dissociation, for those who may not know or need a refresher, is a state where a person disconnects from their thoughts, emotions, sensations, and sense of self. Um, so it's a way that the brain responds to trauma, trying to protect the self from experiencing or remembering overwhelming events. People with dissociative disorders often report blackouts or lapses in memory where they do not recall what they were doing or where they were. And, you know, I don't know enough about Amima to say that this did or didn't happen, but I definitely think it's possible. So a 12-hour dissociative state could happen could for happen. that long. Yes. I mean, I know it can with DID, but for... Yeah, dissociative person. states can last for hours, days, okay, weeks, okay. sometimes. Well, regardless of her state while doing the act, she did snap out of it at one point and realized she needed to hide what she had done. So she got into Bill's 1975 Corvette and looked for a former boyfriend or anyone to help her dispose of the remains that she couldn't put in the disposal. She asked one man who didn't want to listen to her story and turned her away. I believe his name was Jose. He then called the police on her. And they went to her apartment, I think, to do a welfare check. But what they found was a gruesome crime scene. There was blood and human flesh all over the house, staining everything. They found body matter wrapped in foil or shoved into plastic bags or cardboard boxes. They found 11 containers in the house, the garage and the car, all jammed full with Bill's remains. They also found a deep fryer with the hands, a soup pot with body parts, and a glass jar with the contents that wasn't disclosed in the article of what it was. They found his head in the cooler. To put this into perspective, Bill was big. He was six foot four and weighed 230 pounds. After all the body parts were collected, they only found 150 pounds of his remains. So the other 80 pounds were either put down the disposal or who knows where else they went. Oh, and his genitals were never recovered. Courtney? I believe that the chaotic and frenzied nature of the crime scene and how the remains were found, I think, lends some credence to the idea that Omaima was not fully in control or aware of her actions immediately after the attack. As for the missing genitals, I would posit that removing Bill's genitals was symbolic retribution for her own mutilation as a child. Do you want to speculate where they were? Garbage disposal, something else? you think she ate them? I was thinking garbage disposal, mm -hmm. but who knows, yeah. really? Yeah. Somewhere with the other 80 pounds of right. him. Right. Oh, Mima is still out there looking for help. So they're at the house, but she's not there. Uh, she's not knowing the cops are at the apartment and that they found all that. She went to a friend's house and told him that her husband had assault assaulted her. She showed him cuts to her chest, feet, and legs and ligature markings on her wrists. It must have been convincing and perhaps true even. She asked for help disposing of the dentures and entrails she had brought in his car. So I get confused on the dentures thing because one thing said dentures and then also the other said she was going to remove his teeth. So I don't know if the teeth they were talking about were his dentures. Anyways, I'm just acknowledging that. So she told this guy that if he helped her, she would pay him $75,000 and give him several household appliances. He was like, sure, okay, but... Um, then he was, you know, once she left, she, he called the police too. So she was soon apprehended. Her story had changed, changed from what she had told her other acquaintances. During questioning, she told the police that, quote, two women and three guys came into her apartment and murdered Bill and then attempted to frame her by putting his remains all over the place. Courtney? Well, all humans have a natural instinct for self-preservation, so it makes sense that she would present the story that she thought would be the most beneficial with the different sources. So with, like, the guy she knew showing up saying, oh, my, you know, my husband just beat me up, and so I did this in self-defense, um, makes her more sympathetic, and then perhaps to the police she thought that this other story would be more believable. We were just talking about how I was sort of surprised that apparently two of her exes or whatever turned her in pretty quickly. Right. So yeah. I don't know if she, she must not have left a, a great impression on them because it, yeah. it was like right away they both did. Yeah. I mean, the documentary we were watching, 
did say that she had a pattern of um, basically defrauding her boyfriend, so getting with them, staying with them long enough to take their money Mm -hmm. or get stuff from them and then dipping out. Yeah. So. Yep. Um, so Omaima's trial started a year later in 1992. They apprehended her. Yeah. So now she's in tri- going to trial. Her attorney claimed that it was self-defense. She also alleged that Bill would traffic her out to other men, older men, for cars, cash, rent money. Because of the genital mutilations she, suffer- she suffered as a child, sex was painful for her, and the assaults on her during her marriage were apparently very traumatic. She also claimed to have been a victim of child abuse during her time in Egypt and was suffering from battered woman syndrome. She also accused Bill of domestic violence and that he threatened her with not only death, but deportation. Her psychiatrist claimed that she was in a psychotic state when she did all of the things she did and that he had not had a conversation with the subject or he had never had a conversation with anyone that was so bizarre or so psychotic in like his career. Courtney, let's talk a little bit about battered battered women syndrome. Battered women syndrome is a phrase used to describe the psychological impacts of being in a long-term relationship where intimate partner violence is present. It's most often seen in women abused by a male partner, but can apply to all genders. After a long-term abuse, a person can become hopeless, withdrawn, and experience dissociation, And all of that sometimes results in this belief that the only way to escape their violent relationship is to kill their partner. So battered women's syndrome, it's not technically a recognized mental disorder in the DSM-5TR, but it is associated with post-traumatic stress disorder and is most often seen as a legal defense. And given the trauma that Omaima claimed to have experienced as a child and in her relationship with Bill, if what she is saying happened, um, really happened, it definitely seems possible that she would have presented with severe PTSD and possibly battered women syndrome as well. So with battered window, I don't know why I keep saying it, battered woman syndrome, they all feel that killing their partner is the way out? Like that's not necessarily, um, it can get to that point, um, Okay. But, but it does not have to, to be considered bad, battered women's syndrome. Okay. It's hard to say that three times fast. Um, Bill's ex-wife took the stand and said that he was not a violent person. A medical exam was done on Omaima and did not find signs of violence. However, that confuses me if she had all those marks on her before, even if they were self-inflicted. So I don't know. Bill's pathology report did show lit- ligature marks on his wrists. The jury deliberated for six days. So that's, that's quite a long time. It is. Yeah. I mean, like, what was it last week was 42 minutes or <laughs> whatever, like that. and he got the death penalty. But uh, anyhow, before convicting her of second-degree murder, she was sentenced to 27 years to life. Courtney, with second-degree murder, there's usually no real plan. It's more of an impulsive act, you know, without premeditation. What do you think about this case, case based on the little information we have? Do you agree with the jury's verdict? You know, it's hard to say for sure what happened, but I do think that second-degree murder is an appropriate charge. You know, the external abrasions and ligature marks on her could have been from an assault, like she said, uh, but also could have been from consensual sex using bondage, or as the documentary we saw claimed, um, as a result of the effort it took to dismember his body. Um, You know, victims of long-term domestic violence often have scars or evidence on x-rays of things like broken bones but it's possible that if bill was abusive that he was careful or the abuse was more sexual and psychological in nature rather than straight up physical abuse but still omaima killed her husband dismembered his body and possibly cannibalized his flesh and that's a crime she did try to lie and change her story about what happened and solicited help from friends or ex-boyfriends, um, which shows an understanding that what she did was wrong and that there was an attempt at concealment. So I think that has to be taken into consideration. Yeah, I don't know that it was premeditated. I'm sure she thought about killing him, but like what we just saw was that they were maybe expecting one of his daughters to come over for Thanksgiving, and then they didn't. So you know, she wouldn't have 
had this elaborate plan to kill someone if someone was maybe going to come by. No, so I think, no, I think my impulsive. Right. Yeah. I would guess, you know, that if this was a sexual assault or something happened even during consensual sex that maybe triggered a trauma response in her, um, could have kind of brought out that immediate fight or flight response. Uh, Bill also apparently had five children and 18 grandkids, 17 grandkids. I think 17 grandkids. I think is what we just learned as well. So he had a really large family. And she was only 23 or 24 yeah, at the time still. 56, yeah. So she was in Central California's women facility from 1992 to 2011. Then she was transferred to California Institution for Women. She was known to have many long-distance relationships while incarcerated. She even was granted conjugal visits with one of the partners, and he was a man in his 70s. While continuing to claim her innocence, she did point out that she never did hurt this older man, and she could have, as there were knives in the kitchen of the conjugal visit room. So, there you go. He died in 2011, but not by Omaima. Omaima. I'm having issues. Uh, she claimed they were married, those two, but prison officials denied that they were. She was not said to be a model prisoner. She has had many infractions, including theft, fighting, and battering of a staff member. She did become eligible for parole in 2006, but she was denied to her being found, quote, unpredictable and a serious threat to public safety. She was again denied parole in 2011 because she did not take accountability for the murder. So she would have been up for parole in 2023, but I, uh, I didn't find anything about what happened there or if she applied. I, don't know. I didn't either. I, or I was that you for... that put that in there? Yeah, yeah I looked okay. that up trying to see where you, what had happened. I was like, I don't um, remember writing that. <laughs> yeah, I think you'd copied it from before, and it said um, she will be up for parole in 2023, oh, okay. but that was last year. Got it. So I just checked, and there, yeah, I couldn't find anything about her after 2011. Hmm. Maybe she gave up. Maybe. I don't know. But she's still alive. Yeah. She's only, what, in She was born in 68. So yeah, she's only 50s. in her forties, late forties, early fifties. Well, my mom was born in sixty. My mom's sixty-three or four. Okay, but yeah, anyhow, yeah, no, it's it's been a day, and we are like, it's weird. It is being over here. I know, but usually my math skills are better than that. Yeah, well, mine are sometimes. <laughs> I'm good at percentages because I was uh, in in food service for so long. So, anyways, that is the story. Our Thanksgiving episode. Right. Um, Not your typical love and coming together of family over. Right. Thanksgiving is supposed to be coming together and eating together, not eating each other. Exactly. Right. Well, I don't, like I said, I don't know what we're going to do, if we're going to have one next week or not. And I swear I am working on another serial killer case. (laughs) Uh, We are. We just keep getting distracted by these interesting one-off holidays. Yeah. These ones are so much easier to write, too. (laughs) <laughs> like they're easier to research, easier to write, um, you know, and I'm always looking for the easy way out, sort of. So I didn't write an ending. Let's think of one. Um, let's see. What happens when a hot Egyptian model comes pounding on your door in a red Corvette? You look out the window, you call 911. No, I don't know. But this is all backwards. I'm supposed to ask you that. And then you say, go nuts, go home, and go to therapy. Yes, but also do that. Okay. Uh, well, stay safe, everyone. We'll hopefully see you next Tuesday. Bye. Bye.